homeless people.
everyone. I made this announcement earlier, but please make sure that if you are sitting currently in a row that is quite empty and you are in an aisle seat, you're going to end up having to move inside your row because I have a drink that down so that we can go to the other part of your row or you can join a row that's somewhat empty.
good morning, everyone. Can I hear that one more time? Good morning, everyone. All right, because it's Saturday morning. It's a little dreary outside, but it's still, we're all happy to see you all. Um, so my name is Katherine Kelman. I serve as the interim director for the Center of Inclusion, Diversity, Education, and Advocacy, which is also called IDEAS. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and we're really happy to have you all here. Good morning. My name is Dr. Campbell. I am the assistant dean for the Weppner Center for Lead and Service Learning. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. We have a jam-packed day for you. I'm really excited to see you. You came out the rain. You're sitting here with us. We have keynotes, great sessions, and it'll be a great experience for you to network with your peers, and we have some faculty and staff here as well. So. We Lead is a one-day experience that aims to broaden the participants' cultural fluency while promoting and informing the effective social justice advocacy. Lead and Serve and the Center for Ideas invites all our participants, staff, students, and faculty to think provocatively, reflect, and, in, in, and engage in dialogue. This dialogue may not be comfortable, but it will be challenging, but it will be enlightening. We Lead is a space where civil discourse is encouraged in order to create campus community that prioritizes diversity, inclusion, and develops social change agents. Today, begin to reflect on how your identities have hold, hold intersection within your own leadership. It may not be easy at some times to hear stories or people's interpretations because some people cannot separate identity from their own leadership. And so as you start to think about these things, Take a look at your own space and introspection of your own life and your own journey. I leave you with the following quote by Audre Lorde, who is one of my favorite people's quotes. Um, if you don't know her, please Google her. Um, I have come to believe over and over time that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal, and shared, even at the risk of having to be bruised or misunderstood. I give this challenge to you today to step out and step into your own voice. Enjoy the, the day, be challenged by the day. Don't take people's stories, take the things you've learned and share them. Okay, so we know the conference is about diversity and inclusion and how we combine that with our leadership skills, right? I would hope we know what we came out here for on a Saturday morning. So how many of us have been to a conference? That could be I lead, we lead. You've been to a conference for something your student or class, research. So maybe about half of us. So the other part of this conference, in addition to what Kat said, is this is something, a skill that you build on. Just like your leadership development skills, you're going to learn how to conference, right? I'm going to use conference like it's a verb. This is how you network, you build yourself up, you learn from others, and you professionally develop. So one thing I learned when I was an undergrad, my very first class, I had a professor say, you think networking is meeting a director, an entrepreneur, someone who's going to give me a job. Because that's all I thought. I'm only trying to meet those that's trying to give me a job right after I graduate. Wrong. The professor said, look to your left and look to your right. This is also who you need to network with. They will be nonprofit organizers, community organizers, politicians, lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs. They are also going to be the movers and shakers that you need to know. So I encourage you to network with your peers today. We have faculty and staff, and they're wonderful. Network with your peers. Build your roster right now, because those are the people that you come up with, and you build businesses with, you grow ideas with. So think about that today. You want to practice your elevator pitch. When you leave here today and you go to your post-conference experience and you go get your hors d'oeuvres, you have a little talk with someone, introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Go to a session because it invigorates you. You find it exciting, not just because all your friends are gone. You can be the only one to go. Find a new friend in that session. I cannot stress how important it is to start networking and conferencing now. Do not wait until you're a senior. Do not run into your grad school to go to your first conference. Get those jitters out now and become a conferencing pro. We give you these opportunities so you can grow, and you want to grow in the content that we deliver, but you also want to grow professionally and personally today. So I'm challenging you. Introduce yourself to someone you do not know. Introduce yourself to a faculty or staff member. And then introduce yourself to your friends, too, right? Make that, make that connection today and bond and say, hey, we are who we're networking with because we're on the come up. This is who we're going to be. We are the movers and shakers. 
So just remember that as you go through every session today, the post-conference experience, the mixer, everything. So uh, we're going to have our student come up and introduce our speaker for today. Hi everyone, my name is Elijah Kopas. I'm the Director of Multicultural Programming, and I'll be introducing our keynote speaker today. Jacqueline Badalora is the author of Birth of a White Nation, The Invention of White People and Its Relevance Today, and numerous articles. She is an attorney and professor of sociology at St. Xavier University, Chicago, and a former Chicago police officer. Badalora is an editor for the Journal of Understanding and Dismantling Privilege. Dr. Jacqueline Badalora is a keynote speaker, author, trainer, and consultant in workplace and educational inclusion. Her keynotes about the legal invention of the human category white people turn contemporary conceptions of race upside down and reorient thinking about race and human divisions. The keynotes are steeped in law and history made both accessible and nuanced. They are engaging, thought-provoking, and relevant. The keynotes provide attendees with immediate To Toledo and went to Chicago to practice. Her interest in the role of law in creating human differences shaped her graduate work at Northwestern University, where she received her PhD. As a transformational change agent, Jacqueline has both content and passion that equips, empowers, and inspires. For Atlanta University, Adams, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacqueline Battle as Medicaid Where people were 
picked up off the streets who couldn't feed themselves, were thought of as a public nuisance, and were um, sent into workhouses where they literally worked until they died. Children, adults, it didn't matter. Okay? So the king was pretty happy to clear out the workhouses, um, and he also cleared out the prisons, and had people shipped off to the so-called New World um, to labor, to work. Um, now here, the plantation owners were not real thrilled about the prisoners that were shipped over because they didn't listen to authority very well. So that didn't last very long. Um, they they um, convinced the king to stop that practice. Um, but lots of folks were um, sent over, became unfree for a term of years, um, and they constituted the vast majority of people in the colony. People in England who learned about the treatment of British indentured servants were absolutely shocked to learn how British citizens were treated. The work of the historian Edward Morgan um, is drawn upon heavily in this section of my presentation. And his documentations reveal in these letters written um, from people from England who came to the colonies of Maryland and Virginia and observed how British indentured servants were treated, they claimed that they were bought and sold like cattle. Not all laborers um, were equal in, in law and in their status. When I first wrote the book, there was a big debate among academicians about whether the first persons of African descent brought into the colony of Virginia were in fact enslaved or free. Um, and subsequent to the publication of the book, the, the ship manifests were actually found in Portugal, and um, it was uh, claimed by the captain that they were in fact um, enslaved, stolen people from Africa. So um, we know that neither British nor international law either prohibited or restricted um, the enslavement of people from Africa, and we know that slavery was for life. But Here's what we also know. We know that folks, um, that it was not uncommon for there to be free people of African descent. And so you may say, well, how can that be? Slavery is for life, that doesn't add up. But here's what we know from the historical record. We know that many of the first people of African descent brought into these colonies, in fact, came from Barbados, which was already a British colony, so they spoke English, they were already acclimated to this really difficult climate and to the arduous work um, of farming, because they had done even more difficult farming in Barbados, um, growing sugar cane. Um, so they had, re think about that person compared to a poor um, British person from London, on the streets of London, right? Not very many transportable skills, likely. Um, and so the folks from Barbados were much more valuable to the um, plantation owners in these colonies. And so what they were able to do was have side jobs. And they would use, they would sell their skills, and that enabled them to purchase their own freedom and that of family members. The second leading way in which enslaved persons of African descent were able to um, uh, realize freedom was in wills and trusts of large plantation owners. So we see that in the historical record. So it was not uncommon for there to be free people um, of African descent in these colonies. So the socioeconomic ladder at this particular time is really not reflected visually very well in this particular image. The ladder should be 100 times longer, but I couldn't fit it on the slide, so you just have to imagine, all right? Really, the, the imagery we should have is much like that of um, the situation today, the distance between the 1% and the 99%, the gap in wealth. Um, that's what that should look like. So we have the land-holding elite <coughs> in these colonies, and then the 99%, the vast majority, who constituted the laborers. We know from the historical record that these included um, mostly British, but other Europeans, um, uh, Portuguese, Dutch, Irish, Scots, there were um, Africans and there were also a small number of members of native tribes or, or people of First Nations. The, the vast majority of those people 
had been pushed to the margins or killed in warfare or through, um, uh, through illness, excuse me, brought from Europe. Here's what we know that is often most shocking, it was to me as I learned this material, um, what was most shocking to me was to realize this, that those who worked on the same plantation, whether you were from Africa or from England, you were treated the same. They worked together, they ate together, they slept together. There was uh, separation on these plantations at this time, but it was only along gender lines. Treated the same. Here's what else we know. We know that three men of African descent and three British men had the same, the same rights and privileges as a matter of law. So what did that mean? Well, first let me talk about the gender part and why we're only talking about men at the moment. The reason we're talking about men is because the law of coverture established relations between men and women at this time. The law of coverture grew out of feudal England um, and came over to this um, country with the British. And um, it really wasn't challenged until Seneca Falls in the 19th century, the end of it actually. Um, and so the law of coverture is described by the famous British lawyer Barrister Blackstone in this way. Blackstone says, in marriage, the two are made one, and the one is the man. And quite literally, as a matter of law, that's what happened. As soon as she said, I do, uh, her legal presence, recognized in a court of law, vanishes and goes to her husband. Um, so let me just give you a description of what that meant. That meant that a woman had no right to her own wages. She could not sue. She could not enter a contract. She could not establish her own estate planning wishes, a will, or a trust. If she were sexually assaulted, her husband had the claim. Okay? The law of coverture. It established relations between men and women. I know some of you women are like, well, why the hell did anyone get married? Right? Um, but the fact of the matter is that the law of coverture within marriage shaped how women were treated in the society as a whole. So whether you got married or not, um, women were not seen as legitimate, um, legitimately involved in business transactions or property ownership or any of those things. <coughs> so let me talk about what this meant for persons of African descent to have the same rights and privileges as free British men. In concrete terms, this is what that meant. Free men of African descent could vote and they did. They could own enslaved, stolen people from Africa, and some did. They could own British or other European indentured servants, and they did. They could marry a woman, um, a person of the opposite sex, regardless of her nation of origin, and they did. They could run for public office, but I can't find anyone in the historical record who chose to do so. But I know for fact that they could. Did y'all know this? Did you know that there was ever a point on this land that has become the United States where this sort of equality among the masses, the 99% ever existed? I sure didn't. It's kind of hopeful to me to know that it ever even existed. So those marriages, they were very common. In fact, in one county in Virginia, 50% of the free men of African descent were married to British women. Now don't forget that gender imbalance, remember that? We know that among the masses, among the 99%, there is not one, not a single piece of historical, anecdotal, even just anecdotal evidence that these marriages were viewed in a negative light, not one. There was resistance to these marriages, but it didn't come from among the masses. It came from these guys, from the ruling elite. This is a painting of the Maryland lawmakers from the 1600s. And these folks, they crafted a law in 1664. And this law punished, quote, British 
and other freeborn women who marry enslaved Negro men, end quote. Pay attention to that language. British and other freeborn women who marry enslaved Negro men. Now here's the punishment that they imposed. A woman who entered into this marriage, she was enslaved for the duration of her husband's life. And any children that they have are enslaved into their 20s. So that's the punishment. Now, the, what's called the dicta of the law, which is basically kind of an introductory explanation of why the lawmakers crafted this law in the first place, explains that the law, that these marriages, according to the ruling elite here, are seen as um, shameful, quote, shameful matches. They go on to say that the British are deserving of rights and privileges from which others can be denied, and clearly that these women are forgetful of their status. And then they go on to explain that the purpose for this law is to, quote, deter these shameful matches, end quote. Imagine that you are a plantation owner. What do you think about this law? How is it going to serve, how does it serve you? Yeah, woohoo, right? Yay, my property value. As soon as she says I do, my property value just went up, right? Because I just got more property. I have another slave. And then if they have children, my property value goes up even more. That's exactly what happened. Rather than deter these marriages, what happened is large plantation owners encouraged them. So it's not until 1681 that the lawmakers amend this law to correct for this little issue they're having. This time they got it right. This time they imposed punishment on anyone found to have encouraged the marriages. Um, and furthermore, they imposed a punishment on the person who performed the marriage. Right, so they got, they got it right this time. The punishments are in the right places. But here's the language of the amendment. British and other white women are prohibited from marrying blah, blah, blah. Did you hear it? This law of 1681 1681, it's a date you want to remember. If you have notes, write that date down. 1681. I'm making little buttons that say 1681, and thanks to one of your faculty members who had the idea, because I was like, I want to hand you something. I want you to leave with something, not just in your brain and a wrinkle in your brain, or maybe even a few of them, but something to hold on to, to start a conversation. 1681. 1681, and this law, this amendment to the law of 1664 in Maryland, represents the first time on planet Earth that there is a reference in law to a group of humanity called white people. First time. Now look, lawmakers don't typically um, engage in passing law unless it serves a purpose, a need, right? Because you have to go through the work of uh, crafting the law, and then you have to get support to get it passed. It takes effort, it takes energy. So the obvious question is, well, why? And we're going to get to that in a second. First, I want to talk for a minute about this body of law that we're um, discussing here. It's, it's a body of law that we need to know something about. Just as educated people um, knowing something about US history. Now, when I speak to 7th and 8th graders, we practice it because Mary Poppins taught us all to say, yeah, if five-year-olds can learn supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, we can learn, work with me, anti-miscegenation. Anti One more time, anti-miscegenation. Anti yeah, excellent. Okay, so this body of law is called anti-miscegenation law. Anti-miscegenation law made it illegal for white people to marry various people seen as not white. Now, I read in history books, even at the collegiate level, and even at the graduate level, frankly, um, I have read anti-miscegenation law described as laws that prohibited interracial marriage. But that's really not quite correct. Because if, if they prohibited interracial marriage, 
that a person, uh, a member of a First Nation or an indigenous person would be prohibited from marrying, say, a person of Chinese descent. Never did an anti-miscegenation law prohibit such marriages. Only, only, only did they prohibit white people from marrying always people of African descent and various others depending upon the demographics of the area. And they were passed once the United States becomes the United States state by state. Anti-miscegenation law lasted more than 300 years, literally shaping the faces of those who are found today in the United States of America. It was not until 1967 in the aptly captioned case Loving versus Virginia that the US Supreme Court reversed itself and found anti-miscegenation law to be a violation of the 14th Amendment. Anti-miscegenation law is not only important for those reasons, but also because it is within anti-miscegenation law that we see for the first time ever in law reference to a group of people called white people. Now look, were people looking as pale as me before 1681? <laughs> Duh, of course, right? But the point is they weren't white people. They weren't called white people. They weren't viewed as white people. They didn't have an identity called white people. Right, they were refer referred to as, in, in the criminal codes, they were referred to simply by their nation of origin. The Dutch, the Scots, the Irishman, the Scotswoman, the, the Dutch woman, whatever, by the, wherever their country of origin was. Um, in other legal texts, they were referred to as British and other freeborns, British and other Christians, and references like that. But never white. Never white. We've been talking primarily about Maryland, but let's jump over to Virginia real quick. So Virginia, in 1691, passed its first anti-miscegenation law, and they made it illegal for both white men and white women to um, marry persons of African descent or a member of a native tribe. I don't want to leave you thinking that gender equality prevailed in Virginia because nothing could be further from the truth. So let me, let me fill in this history. Even though the letter of the law seems to make this prohibition apply equally to white men and white women, um, that is not how it played out in terms of enforcement. What historical records reveal is that lots of white men were violating anti-miscegenation law but rarely were they prosecuted. So we know from when you fold in enforcement practices, we know that these laws, anti-miscegenation law, was primarily a legal mechanism to control the relationality and the sexuality of white women and non-white men. And when you fold in enforcement, we see that um, the effect of anti-miscegenation law was to make white women exclusively available to white men, but then as a matter of practice, all women available to white men. So the question becomes, well, when they were prosecuted, what, what happened? Here's the line crossed that could end up having a white man in violation of anti-miscegenation law prosecuted. If he dared to treat his non-white spouse in a way deemed only appropriate for a white woman in public. That's what could land him prosecuted. So let's return to that question. What happened between 1664 and 1681 that can help us understand this entirely new emergence of a group of humanity called white people? And that answer is Bacon's Rebellion. Y'all, you know, this was a huge rebellion. Lasted well over a year. More than 30% of the population was, um, as a matter of record, supportive of the rebellion. Lots of things happened that um, made the leader of the rebellion, this guy named um, Nathaniel Bacon, he didn't have to look very far to find disgruntled people. So these are some of the things happening that, that um, caused so many people to be unhappy and to join in the rebellion. Uh, number one was that 
Remember that population goal that we talked about? That ended. It ended. And so plantation owners were completely panicked about how they're going to replenish their labor supply. Um, so what they did was they began to impose really harsh punishments and extensions of folks' term of indenture for really minor infractions. So indentured servants were being treated worse and, and having their terms of indenture extended um, significantly. Um, the other thing happened is that even those lucky enough to finish their term of indenture, um, there was no good farmland to buy anymore because the king gave it to his buddies. And even if you could um, buy your farmland and start your own tobacco farming, the price of tobacco dropped and the king raised taxes. So it was kind of a perfect storm for a really huge rebellion. So again, this rebellion lasted well over a year, was led by Nathaniel Bacon. He died pretty early on from um, uh, wounds that he received. The first phase of the rebellion fo focused on um, Native Americans because Nathaniel Bacon believed they had murdered his neighbors. And he was really angry with the ruling elite that they didn't respond violently. Um, so the first phase of the rebellion focused on that. And then the second half of the rebellion focused on the ruling elite. Because while the, the laborers, the 99%, were all facing harsher conditions and, and uh, their chances to succeed were, were being constricted. There were some in the colony doing really well, and that was the 1%. The rebellion was ultimately quashed only after um, the English sent in troops, and only after all of the British colonies had expressed um, extreme fear and anxiety about Bacon's rebellion. Even if they weren't having any rebelliousness within their own colony, um, those who led in all the British colonies in North America were absolutely terrified. How do we know this? We know this from the work of the historian Theodore Allen. And what he did was he, he digs into the letters written from the legal oversight authority in London, right, that that group of lawyers who had oversight over the British colonies, the laws in the British colonies, and then the lawmakers in Virginia, <coughs> Maryland, and all the other colonies. <clears throat> what Theodore Allen's work reveals to us is that the lawmakers in Virginia told the folks in London, do not worry. We have this under control. We are going to pursue a divide and conquer strategy. Remember that. A divide and conquer strategy. And this is what we see. In the decades following Bacon's rebellion, masses of, of, of bundles of laws begin to get passed. One of the first laws um, prohibits free blacks from holding public office. Another um, prohibits white people from marrying a person of African descent or a member of a native tribe. Whites are required to be paid goods, including gun and powder, upon completion of their term of service. Contrast that with the law that prohibits free blacks from possessing a weapon. And then a law is passed that prohibits blacks from testifying against whites. These bundles of laws radically transform colonial society. Remember, up until this moment, a free person of African descent and a free person of British descent had the same rights, privileges, and opportunities as a matter of law. Never, ever will that be the same or have it. How crazy it must have been to be a person who finds yourself one day having all these normal rights and privileges and finding them stripped away, completely stripped away. And then those masses of people, mostly from England, but also from other places in Europe, who were the vast majority of the population, to find themselves 
And some of them, anyway, clearly white, right? Because we knew from the language of the law that British people were white, British and other white. But who else was white? Who knows? And what did it mean to be white? Well, let's look at that. Let's look at just this one law. Uh, one law um, the law that prohibits blacks from testifying against whites. What did, what did those who found themselves called white learn about what it means to be white? From just that one law. That I dominate. I dominate those who are not white by virtue of law. Not only that, but this law aligns the law with me, with my people's perspective. There is an alignment between law and white perspective and interests, established in the colonial era. And what did, what did people of African descent learn from just that one law? You better be passive and submissive to white people or else. Now, these laws, people learned these laws pretty quickly, especially if you happen to be on a plantation. And why is that? Because the plantations were required to radically reorganize um, very quickly. White people were required to be in a position of managerial authority relative to people of color. Right? So now those plantations, it's not just a gender division in terms of housing and work, um, but now um, people of color, people of African descent specifically, are separated from those seen as white. So that happened very quickly. If you happen to work somewhere out in the boonies, um, kind of away from the center of activity, which was, doesn't seem you know, uncommon at all at this particular era, these bundles of laws were required by law to be read two times a year at church on Sunday and on the courthouse steps. These laws that were passed after Bacon's Rebellion asserted an entirely new group of humanity called white people. And it radically reorganized colonial society. And the people who asserted, the lawmakers who asserted this new group called white people, they didn't have to hand over, a, a, well, there weren't dollars or pennies yet, but a pence. They didn't have to hand over any of their material wealth to accomplish this new order. What they did was they dug out an entirely new bottom to society, and they tossed people of African descent and members of native tribes within that bottom. And now, something also shifted dramatically. Not only is there a new bottom to colonial society, a much lower, more terrible bottom to society, but now uh, th there was one thing that the 99% could all agree on, and that is that we hated them. But now, now there's a connect between those laborers now called white laborers and the white ruling elite. And that connect is a thread through this label called white imbued with the presumption of our superiority. So there is now a connect with the masses of laborers who are still the great majority called white laborers and the ruling elite. So let's wrap this up. So white people, what, what does this history teach us about white people? Well, first of all, white is a construction, right? In 1681, the, the genetic material of British and Portuguese and Dutch and Scots transformed into something that we can now call white? No, that's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. It is constructed. It is about power. This thing we call race, it's about power. Power. It's about domination and subjugation. So we know from this history that white people are built on the idea that the British had of themselves as white, as, quote, deserving of rights and privileges from which 
others can be denied, end quote, which is from that law of 1664. And that language, that's not, you don't have to take a big step to get to white supremacy from there. Not at all. We know from this history that white is the tool by which we, the 99%, have been divided and separated from each other, and white has served that purpose ever since. White is imbued with the presumption of being superior to non-white. White worked to connect European laborers to the British elite. I still see it today. I have white students who have a greater affinity with Melania Trump and Paris Hilton than they do to their African-American peers and Hispanic colleagues. This history is deep, and it is with you and me and us now. All right, let's jump ahead. How's everybody? Bring it in. Woo! All right. So when you go home and want to talk about this, and you're like, oh, man, I can't remember that law or reference that, you can get access to all of this PowerPoint material and an outline of, of all of it on my web page. Okay, it comes, it's a free five-day e-course. I just broke it into five little bits. Anybody can access it. Share it with your friends, use it in your classes. Um, that's what it's there for, okay? So, and it's jbattalora.com. Um, so, we're good. Everybody's okay? White people have been invented. Let's jump ahead 100 years. We have the American Revolution, Declaration of Independence, a brand new country called the United States of America. This is where um, Congress met in New York, the very first Congress. These images should look familiar. So the, the very first Congress of this brand new republic were tasked with crafting all of the laws of a brand new nation, including in those laws, um, included in those laws, were laws um, concerning immigration, naturalization. Just to be clear, naturalization is the legal process that one must go through to become a citizen when you're not born in a nation. Okay, so naturalization. And our founders determined that in order to become a naturalized citizen of this United States of America, you must be white. This law, this requirement of being white lasted more than 150 years. We've had people who fought wars um, for this country, denied citizenship. You had to be white to become a citizen. Who cares? White citizenship, is that really a big deal? Why does it matter? Well, let's think about how this works. If you're a citizen, what do you get to do? You get to vote. And voting is the opportunity to express the needs and desires of your community, of your people. If you are denied that opportunity, then you are passive, you are relegated to the sidelines politically, and it worked to render non-white groups cheap, dependent labor. I can see that I, oh, I have 10 more minutes. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> That's all I have left. Um, I did better today. <laughs> uh, so here's the very first um, naturalization law. So let me just say a couple things um, about that naturalization. It's just one example, but it, it's an example that makes it really clear that white superiority has been baked in this nation as a matter of founding law. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. But it doesn't change the fact that that's the fact. There is not a single institution grown out of this country that is not built upon a foundation of white superiority. Not one. We can see it really clearly in terms of law. And remember that law where black people were prohibited from testifying against white people? Remember that one? That particular law really worked. It served its purpose. You know how I know that? Because we see that law, that prohibition, throughout U.S. history. In 
1848, after um, uh, gold was discovered in California, large numbers of men from China came to work, helped build the railroad, paying for gold. And guess what we see out west? Guess who now is prohibited from testifying against white people? Guess who now cannot naturalize and become U.S. citizens? Yeah, you got it. Keeping them cheap and dependent labor. Cheap and dependent labor. And, what if, and, and white people get what? All kinds of things, right? Because um, in 1913, those ineligible, right? You don't even hear the racial language anymore. Those ineligible for naturalization were blocked from buying land or even renting land out west. So white people, again, get an unearned advantage because now there's more land available for me at cheaper prices. Then, after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, when the U.S. virtually doubles in size and, we, and Mexico is chopped in half, now we have this half of the room who yesterday was Mexicans living in Mexico, and today you're Mexicans living in the U.S. and you didn't move. Guess what happened? In these regions that are now the U.S., from Colorado to California, what do we see? Even though by virtue of federal law, y'all are white. But at the local level and the state level, you are rendered not white. And we see laws passed that prohibit you from testifying against white people. So that law works. Or we wouldn't see it again and again. And with each of those laws that limit and restrict people of color, unfair advantages are conferred upon white people. Whether we ask for it or not, whether we want it or not, doesn't matter. It's baked in, built in. These structures that have been put in place as a matter of founding law confer privilege to white people. That's why we call it white privilege. It also constructs a reality that causes what Robin DiAngelo terms white fragility. If you haven't read her article or her book, it's a must. White fragility. Um, you can access it free online. Um, so, so what do we do with this? So here, it, if changes are going to happen here at your university in beautiful Boca Raton, Florida, Y'all are the biggest, most powerful force of change. When you demand that whiteness, whites get named, <coughs> your professors are going to be a little uncertain probably at first, but they'll get, wow, I'm missing something. Just like when, when women, um, many decades ago now, began asking, well, where were women? And how were women treated in this historic moment? And, and how did masculinity shape X, Y, or Z? In, in the same way that we've inserted a gender um, analysis, we have to insert a race analysis that captures whiteness, right? Because the dominant construction of race is one that, that captures, we see race when a non-white person is present. But when they're just a bunch of, if I may, if us three white people are having a conversation, is race involved? Of course it is. It's just whiteness involved. Right? So, so start asking your professors in class, well, how did whiteness shape Thomas Jefferson's writings? Right? Because we'll ask that of um, African American authors. How did their blackness, their Hispanicness, their Native Americanness influence how they wrote what they wrote? And we should be asking that. But we also need to be asking how did the, the white authors, whiteness, shape how they wrote what they wrote when they wrote it? Do you see how capturing what, Let me just really be clear about the danger when we don't. When we don't see the whiteness as a racial something. It just works for white superiority to continue to pass under the rug. Because we're not seeing it. We're not naming it. You start, if y'all began a practice, if everyone in this room, wow, look at this number of people in here. If in our regular discourse, 
we can start naming the, the whiteness of regular people. We do it with people of color all the time, right? Oh, this person came, and, and the, the, there's a new hire. He's an Asian man. But if he were a white man, we'd just say there's a new, there's a new guy hired, right? So go out today and say, yeah, we had this speaker today. This white woman talked about wealth. Start naming white people's whiteness just in your everyday conversation. Most people will be a little shocked, and, and they should, because you are fracturing the normativeness of whiteness. And it, it takes fracturing the normativeness of whiteness for us to start to fracture the taken for granted white superiority that continues to confer white privilege, whether we ask for it or not, want it or not. Really quick, I think I have about 60 seconds left. If, if you are comfortable and able, I'd invite you to close your eyes just for a second. Now imagine that everything you just heard is the same. Same words, same voice, but I am black. How did it feel? Some of you may feel a greater affinity for me. Some of you may hear narratives in your head. That angry black woman. Right? The, the, the dominant narratives that would allow you to dismiss me, to delegitimize me. If you heard those narratives, congratulations, you're successfully enculturated. And if you heard them, that's where you start, inside you. Paying attention each day to the way that those dominant narratives, those stereotypes, keep us reasserting whiteness in a way that asserts domination and exclusion. We don't have to get rid of white people, I don't think, anyway. Um, open, open, that's not the case. Um, what we have to do is reconstruct whiteness. Whiteness that's not domination and exclusion. Whiteness that is liberatory and inclusive. And we can do that, and we do it one person at a time, one relationship at a time, one policy at a time, one law at a time. White superiority was here before you or I arrived. It does not have to be here when you leave. Make it happen. Good luck. We want to make sure that we um, just give a couple of minutes of time uh, for a couple of questions. Is that okay, Dr. Bella? So we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions. Okay. If you have a question, just stand and we'll take you right where you are. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Historically, 
um, since before the founding of the nation. It's really hard to, to imagine a time when that wasn't the case. But this seems to have been a time when that, in fact, was the case. Right? That, they, that, that British um, and African laborers on the same plantation saw each other as, as colleagues, as, as humans in a shared situation. Not, and, and sure, people from, from with different cultures and nationalities and languages. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that the first Africans coming from Barbados already spoke English? Yes. Okay, good, because that's, a, I think, a pretty big, a big piece. Yes? So you said in 1681 was the first Mm-hmm, yes. Class-based rights, there were different rights based upon class. People had access. Based on your color skin. That's correct. So can I ask why um, in 1681 they chose to I guess, take blacks under the issue of race? Well, the, the evidence, um, the historical evidence reveals that they wanted to, that they saw an answer to ensure that Bacon's Rebellion would not happen again, that the way to ensure that such a rebellion would not happen again is to divide the 99%, right? Because the language in their own letter says, we're going to pursue a divide and conquer strategy, right? Um, do I know why? I mean, my guess is they tried white. Who the hell knew it would be one of the most successful constructs in you know, recent global history. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so do I know why they chose that particular one? Not necessarily. Um, do, it, is it clear that the visual myth that, through which we now see race likely played a role in influencing how they chose to divide? Probably. Probably. Yes? How did they become white? No, I mean, how did they get in? I mean, I don't know. Right, well, uh, this emerged out of the British colonies. For those of you who are considering graduate work, um, when I work with graduate students, I'm always like excited by those who, who want to at least have part of their graduate work engrossed in history, because I want to know, here's what I know. I know that 1681 in this particular law in Maryland is, is the first reference in law to white people that we know of. Right? And, and certainly in Virginia, we see how it very quickly became part of their laws. And we know that it spread, but I don't know exactly how it spread. Um, we, we know that it has, in fact, in a global sense today. I know and every time I'm invited to lecture somewhere outside of the US, I have to dig in and do research and try to find the first appearance of white people in that nation. And so I know in Canada, um, it wasn't until the early 20th century when at least through their um, uh, census material, we see reference to white people, right? So I don't have an answer for you. I know that it's spread, obviously, um, but I don't know all of the particulars. It's an area um, that is ripe for exploration. Let, let me get someone who has it offered and I'll come back. Yes? of equal opportunity, of liberty for all, of a legal system that's for everyone and not just white people. If we care about those things, we, the choices have to be choices of, of inclusion, 
Because when you look at our laws where um, white systemic advantage was built in, and I have, I have a new article, it's coming out I think within the next six months. I don't know what it'll be called, I think whiteness maybe, I don't know, whiteness competency, something. Um, it, it includes a chart that, that covers each decade of US history. And what I do is I try to give, I, I, I try to concretize the sociologists, um, Ruth Frankenberg, she coined the term whiteness, I think in the early 90s, in a book called White Women, Race Matters. And, and she defined whiteness as having sort of these three dynamic components. The first is um, a structural advantage that confers white privilege, like the requirement, of, for example, like the requirement of being white to naturalize. And then that structural advantage shapes how white people see ourselves, see others, and see the world. And then the third part is that, again, in this dynamic, I have it sort of in these clean, these clean columns, but it was certainly this dynamic, dynamic interchange, shaped um, dominant habits and values, like white equals American, right? That, that law worked to shape that habit, that white, e white equals American. Which, by the way, we keep alive linguistically, right? Because even if I came to this country yesterday and I speak English pretty well, I'm just American. Some of you are Hispanic American, Asian American, Ar Arab American, right? Contingent Americans. I'm just American. Um, so, so we need to know that, that history. And, and if you look at that history, you see that Every time, the, as a whole, whiteness is about domination, subjugation, and exclusion. Like that just screams from, from this, ch these charts. Um, and so the new construct of whiteness has to be the opposite. And we, we, we assert whiteness every day, y'all. We do it in who we choose to sit next to, who we share our dorm room with, who we eat with, who we'll date, who we want our children to play with over at their house or not, what neighborhoods we drive through and those we avoid, how we will have our community's resources dispersed from, from construction contracts we give to education. We make daily choices that are either reasserting whiteness as white superiority or, or challenging it. And I had, did gonna, I get you? Okay, I, we're gonna cut oh, the question, me. sorry. Only because we have a great opportunity after this for, to yeah. actually, I, 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 yeah, that's okay. a great question. Um, so we do have a session with the speaker, so if you are wanting to engage even more, please go with that session. Um, so please look in for you and that session should be done. So, so while we're all looking around, Battle Laura is having another session. Uh, 20 seats, it's exclusive. So I suggest you make it there when we dismiss. We're not dismissing yet. Before we conclude, I would like to invite down Dr. Corey King. He is our Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. So he can speak to you today before you begin uh, with your session. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Go out. Go out. And go welcome to all of you. Let's let's give our professor a hand again. Well, thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I'm almost tempted to go back to school if you teach a course. So, uh, that was a great, great session for us. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a Saturday. It's raining, um, but you all are here. All of our students in the room, raise your hand so we can see our students. Let's thank you for being here today. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we have faculty members in the room. Faculty members, raise your hands. Let's see our faculty. We got faculty here as well. Thank you very, very much. The Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, we are committed to diversity as Florida Atlantic University is. We are the number one diverse institution in the state of our 12 system universities, right? That's a good thing. And we're 27th in the country in terms of our diversity. So this We Lead conference is very appropriate for us at this time. In the fall semester, we have an I Lead conference. 
And as a result of that iLead conference, members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority and uh, the Progressive Black Men and Women Empowerment Group and Student Government approached the division about hosting another conference in the spring that focused on social justice. And that's what this conference does, social justice awareness and advocacy. We first had this conference a couple of years ago, 70 people participated. Today we have over 300 of you in this conference today. So thank you very, very much for being here. I want to say thank you to Kat Kilman, who is our interim director of our diversity area ideas and her team. Andrea Oliver, Guzman Oliver, uh, who is uh, our Associate Vice President for Student Outreach and Diversity. Woo! Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Dr. Larry Fairman, who is our Associate Vice President and Dean of Students, is here also. We thank him for being here. And there is a commitment from the division, and you don't have to clap, but all along that back wall right there are the deans and directors of the Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. And you see from student conduct, from, involved, from enrollment management, undergraduate admissions, the Global Engagement Center, technology, fraternity and sorority life, first generation student success, the Student Health Center there, new student transition family engagement, financial aid, Owls Care Health Promotion, Student Accessibility Services, Kirk's Highway Around the Corner, Health and Wellness, the Campus Recreation Center. We got the partner campuses here as well. So there is a commitment, I'm looking across, so I get everybody. Student media, there is a commitment from the Division of Student Affairs for what you do today. So the conference is here, day-long session. Please enjoy yourself, learn, grow, develop, become more aware of our social justice issues, and again, we thank you for coming from St. Xavier University to be with us today. Go Owls! Today. Please, first note, we um, have limited space in almost all our sessions, so please get there within prompt time. And we will close doors once we hit capacity in each room. Please make sure you have on your name tag at all times, especially during our snack break time, which is on your schedule. If you don't have your name tag on, you will not be able to get a snack.